says it again. In fact, he says it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Paul is writing from house arrest in Rome. He is chained to a Roman soldier. How is it that he continues to write and speak about joy and rejoicing and thanksgiving? I want to know how to do that. I I want to know the secret to that. How about you? I mean, look, there are times when it's easy to rejoice. There's times when it's easy to be thankful. When gathered around with family around a huge table with lots and lots of food, it's easy to thank God at those times, if you like your family. It's easy when the good news has come in to rejoice and thank God when you've just graduated, when you just received the job, when you just got the promotion, when your girlfriend just said, yes, I do, and became your wife, and for your ladies, when your boyfriend did the same thing, becoming your husband. It's easy in times like that to rejoice, but what about when the diagnosis has come in and it's cancer or what about when instead of receiving the promotion you got laid off or what about when there's family trouble and the spouse has not been faithful or the kids have decided to leave and not come home it's hard what about when you're in prison for the sake of the gospel And yet, that's exactly when Paul is rejoicing in the Lord. What an amazing, amazing example he sets for us here. Now, listen. I'm not saying that we as Christians will never feel sad. We will. In fact, this very same person who wrote this letter in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 says that not only should we rejoice with those who rejoice, but we should also weep with those who weep. Paul understood that there are times of weeping and yet even in the midst of times of weeping and sadness and loneliness maybe even fear and doubt what Paul had was a bedrock of joy a foundation that allowed him even in those times to rejoice in the Lord and so as we are continuing our walk through Paul's letter to the Philippians this year as we strive to be worthy of Christ's gospel as we strive to walk in a manner that is commensurate and goes along with the gospel that Jesus has provided us we want to talk today about really living in that good news about the recognition that that for all the bad news that we do experience and we walk through and it affects us and 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 we can walk through those things in healthy ways as we mourn sometimes are angry, sometimes fear, as we walk through those things in healthy ways, that at the same time, because of the good news in Jesus Christ, that we will continue to be able, even in those times, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, Paul basically gives us a four-part prescription for having this kind of peace that allows us to rejoice no matter what is going on. But as we talk about it this morning, I'd like to invite you into kind of the study process that I went through on this that helped me, I I hope, grasp Paul's advice just a little bit better. Rather than thinking of each step of this process in a vacuum just all by itself, there's two things that I'd like for us to consider. And I, I want you, as we read through this, for you to think of it in this way. The first thing is remember what he just said to Yodia and Syntyche. There in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fam- uh, fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here are these two sisters that are having a disagreement and Paul has just said to them, all right, it's time for you guys to agree and And whoever the fellow worker is, he said, I want you to help them. They've just been told to agree. They've just been told all this stuff in this letter that I've been talking about. Really, ladies, it's about you. And uh, you you two need to get along. 
And so then he follows it up with this bit of advice for the entire church. I'd like for us to think with each step of them, what did these two sisters need to hear? Why, why were they needing to hear this in, this in this disagreement? Of course, you don't know what their disagreement was. Guess what? Neither do I. But have you ever been in a disagreement? Have you ever had a fuss with somebody? Maybe a spouse, maybe a sibling, maybe your brother or sister in Christ. You ever been there? Am I the only one? Okay, all right. So we know what that's like. We may not be able to know the specific thing that they've been through, but we know how those things work, right? We've been there. We've made the mistakes. We've been involved with someone else who made those mistakes. So putting ourselves in the shoes of these sisters, walking through, okay, why, why these four things? And then the second question is, is kind of reverse engineering. If this is the solution, what was the problem? If, if, here's, if he gives a step, if he says, here's what I want you to do, what is it that we're normally doing instead of that thing? The, the termite, if you will, that Satan puts in our lives that eats away at our joy, the hindrance, the obstacle. So if he's going to say, hey, you need to climb that mountain, then obviously the problem is, is we're down in the valley, right? Can, so, so let's, as we walk through these four things, see if we can figure out, one, why did those two sisters need to hear it? And two, what's the problem that's attacking? And I think when we grasp those things, then this four-part prescription suddenly comes to life. And, and starts to fit us and help us. So I want to invite you in that process of study with me. Before we go through that, would you bow with me in prayer, please? God and Father, you who are full of joy and rejoicing, and yet, I know that there is so much in this world that is upsetting to you, angering to you, disappointing. It saddens you. I know that oftentimes, Father, we sadden you and yet you are able to have joy and we want to be like that and we see Paul who had a foretaste of that rest who was able to go to the mountain even in the times of the valley and the wilderness we long for that as well we don't want to simply go through the motions when we gather here as a church singing words but not rejoicing we want to be singing and rejoicing from the heart even, even in those times when we have sadness in our lives. And as amazing it is to know that sadness and joy can, can happen in the same place. We know, Father, that you have sent your son Jesus to die for us and to provide us forgiveness. And it's a, a bedrock of joy so that we can rejoice even in our dark days, looking forward to our time with you in eternity. So, Father, we pray that you would help us this morning to listen to what Paul's instruction and advice is that we can see the things that whittle away at our joy and rejoicing so we can take up arms against them. And by your grace and your power and by your spirit strengthening us in our inner being, that we might be able to overcome and hang on to the joy that we have because of the salvation we find in Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. The first thing that he says, if we want to be able to rejoice in the Lord, is let your reasonableness be known to everyone. I do not expect you to remember this on the test. Don't often like to go back, but this this is an odd word. The word that's translated here, epiakes, is one that's really hard for us to translate into English. There's not really an English word that just all by itself conveys the meaning. So different translations say lots of different things here. Some translations say gentleness. Some say graciousness. Some say, uh, I think, contentedness and forbearance. Some talk about yielding. you, You can see that this is tough. The four other times that it's used in the ESV, it's translated gentle or gentleness. But the problem is, is in the five places where this word is used in the New Testament, most of them are just lists, and so we don't get a description, and and we don't get any surrounding context, really, that helps us understand exactly 
what this word meant and how it was used. And so we're just going to have to rely on some of the dictionaries that have studied the language back in its context at that time. And the lexicon Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, which is a terrible bore to say over and over again, so normally it's just called BDAG, says <laughs> Bauer, Danker, Art, Gingrich, you get it? BDAG. Here's what it says the word means. This word is not insisting on every right of letter of law or custom. Okay, so first of all, please do not get caught up in the idea that I'm telling you that it's hard to find a single English word that translates this. I know people hear that, oh, we can't translate the Bible. No, we absolutely can. Just it probably would have been better for them to put the definition instead of trying to come up with just a word. Because really what it says, and this gets the accurate meaning across, and it's not confusing, and we don't miss it, if we would just say, let your ability to not insist on every right of letter of the law or custom be known to everyone. And now we get what Paul was talking about. Once I understand what this word is telling me, as it's, it's telling me, don't spend all your time trying to figure out exactly what your rights are. I can start to piece together what's going on. So let's think about Yodi and Syntyche. Have you ever been in a disagreement with someone? How does that normally go? Normally, what, uh, what are you doing? Well, aren't you normally saying, this is what I deserve? This is mine? I should have this? Isn't that... It, it, it should go my way. I don't like your way. I want it to be my way. You crossed the line. You crossed into my stuff. Aren't those the kind of things where we have disagreements? And what Paul is saying to these sisters is, sisters, you need to agree. Look, you need to let your yieldingness, your reasonableness, your gentleness, your graciousness, your ability not to sit there looking at all the law books and figuring out exactly what your rights are. You need to let everybody see your ability to let that go to be humble enough to view others as more significant than yourselves. And as I start to process this through, and I think about this disagreement that these two sisters were having, then I start trying to figure out, okay, what is it? What is the weapon that Satan is using to attack our joy and their joy and our ability to rejoice? I recognize it's the weapon of entitlement. I deserve. I deserve things to go my way. I deserve to have the things that I want. Doesn't that happen when we get in disagreements with others? And isn't that really at the heart, often what the disagreement is about? I wanted something, you got in the way of it. I want something, you're opposing it. I want it to go a certain way, you want it to go a different way. And there's that idea that we are entitled to do it, I'm entitled to do it my way. Anybody else ever been caught up in that? Yeah. He says that, that, that eats at our joy, that eats at our ability to rejoice. When I'm spending all my time focusing on the things that I want, but I'm not getting. When I'm focusing on my mind on, on the people who are getting away of the things that I want, it makes it really hard to have joy. It makes it really hard to have peace. It makes it really hard to rejoice and so what satan does is he kind of magnifies our sense of entitlement i deserve my rights listen to how satan uses this just on an individual level in the temptation of jesus in matthew chapter 4 in matthew chapter 4 remember now at the end of chapter 3 jesus was baptized and when he was baptized the clouds parted and the sun shone down and a dove, which was the Holy Spirit, came and rested on the head of Jesus and from the heavens the voice said, This is my beloved Son. I like him a lot. Or in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son and I like him. I'm happy with him. I'm pleased with him. He causes me joy and rejoicing. That's what he heard. And as soon as that was done the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. Because that's, of course, what we expect to happen right after the greatest moment in our lives, is to be driven by God's Holy Spirit out into the wilderness, to live among the beasts, and to have no food. For 40 days, he fasted. And the text says there in Matthew chapter 4, and he was hungry. You think? 
And the tempter came to him in verse 3 and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Do you hear Satan using this weapon we're talking about in this? Well, Jesus, you, you, you claim to be the Son of God. Surely the Son of God is entitled to never be hungry. Surely God's Son is entitled to always have food. Surely God's Son deserves to always have the conveniences and pleasures of life. Surely you are entitled. Why not go ahead and turn this stone into bread? And Jesus says, Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He says, I don't know that I'm God's son because I get everything I want. I know I'm God's son because, devil, God said so. And I'm going to live by his word. And if he says, I'm his son, I'm his son. But, but do you see the weapon here? And how many times have Christians been turned away from the Lord because of saying things like, I serve a loving God who wants me to be happy. Do you hear what that is? Do you hear what that statement is? That statement is, because I faithfully serve God of love, I am entitled to get everything I want. And if I didn't get what I want, that must not be what God wants for me. Because I am God's child. I am entitled to a spouse who is pleasing to me and loves me and always does exactly what I want so we can have a happy marriage. I am entitled to children who obey me and always submit and surrender and do their chores and never rebel and never fall away. I am entitled to food, the best food. I am entitled to pleasure and leisure and convenience. I am entitled to happiness at every moment, to entertainment, to recreation. I am entitled to that promotion. I am entitled to that job. I am entitled to food and water and clothes and a house that I own myself. I'm entitled. And the more I think about all the things that I think I'm entitled to that I'm not getting, the harder it is to have joy and rejoicing. And so what does Paul say to us? Paul says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. And if that word reasonable doesn't get the whole thing across to you, that's fine. Pick whichever one of those words makes it fit. Or, or you know what, just remember this picture. Because really what that word is describing is the picture that Paul gave us already in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. <clears throat> and I know that's tough as we think about it, but can I remind you what comes after that? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because that's what reasonableness is. That's what this word means. That picture right there, remember that. Overcome entitlement with what we just read there. And we'll have a bedrock from which to have joy and rejoicing even when we're not getting all the things that we want. Step number one, overcome entitlement with reasonableness. Excuse me, just a moment. <clears throat> Well,
What's the second thing that he says? He continues on here in Philippians chapter 4. And he says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now our step here about trying to figure out what the weapon is that Satan is using, in this one it's real easy because in this one he just says it, doesn't he? He says don't be what? Don't be anxious. Don't have anxiety. Don't have fear. Here's the word that I want to use for this. Worry. What does he do? Satan causes us to worry. Now, we can think about this in a vacuum, and if we were to think about this in a vacuum, we would immediately jump back to Matthew chapter 6, and we would remember what Jesus said just about worry in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, where he highlights, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you drink, or your body, what you will put on. Look Look at the birds of the heavens. They don't reap or sow or toil and put into barns, and yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they? And he gets all the way to the end of this passage and he says, look, don't worry about these things. That's what the Gentiles, that's what the heathen, that's what the pagans, that's what everybody outside of the kingdom of Jesus Christ worries about. Don't worry about those things. Why? Because your Father knows what you need. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now, when we hear that, we can understand why people who don't have enough food might be worried about that right and if they're not sure that their clothes are going to last and if they're going to be able to find some more we can understand why they might be worried about that but jesus says don't even worry about that don't don't get caught up in anxiety about that because your father knows what you need and he provides it for you seek him seek his kingdom seek his righteousness and so we often talk about worry from that standpoint but let's jump back into the context of philippians chapter four and think about our two sisters here why, why would they need to hear this statement about not worrying? Hmm. Well, what have they just been told? They've got some kind of disagreement going on. And they've just been told, look, you need to, to let that go. You need to treat Euodia, you need to treat Syntyche as more significant. You need to seek her interests instead of your own interests. And the same thing was said to Syntyche. You need to seek her interests instead of your own interests. Now, having heard that bit of advice, again, you ever been in a fuss? You you ever been? Do you remember what James says about what causes our fusses and our fights? In James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. What causes fights? I want something, and I'm not getting it. You're in the way. Maybe you want the same thing, or maybe you want something that contradicts and is opposed to this, and now we're, we're fighting. It's, it's kind of like when we just think about geopolitical battles between kings and nations. There's some kind of territory. There's some territory we're fighting over. And and whatever it is that we're fighting over, that's that's the thing. I desire that, and I'm not getting it. And what did Paul just tell me? Paul just told me, well, don't worry about that. Paul just told me, let your reasonableness be known. Let, Let your ability to yield. Let your ability to treat the other person as more significant, as more important, as their interests are the ones that you should be reaching. He said, I want you to focus on that more. Okay, now, in that context, what are you worried about? Is it not, if I don't fight for the thing I want, how am I going to get it? Is that that not what we're worried about? You've just told me to quit fighting about this thing. Paul, you've just told me to actually give in to the other person. But what about what I need? What about what I want? How am I going to get it if I don't stand up for it? That's what they tell us to do in the world, right? How are you going to get it unless you fight for it? Isn't that the worry that's going on here? Well, Paul has an answer. And here's where he starts. This is interesting. He starts with the phrase, the Lord is at hand. Unfortunately, when we hear this phrase, because of how at hand is used in other passages, we automatically think what he's saying is the return of the Lord is almost here. And that causes us a little bit of a problem because we know this letter was written 2,000 years ago. 
well, what on earth does that mean? The Lord is at hand, and it's been 2,000 years, and now we start trying to figure out, well, why, why would Paul say he's at hand and he hasn't come for 2,000 years? The word here just means near. It just means near. And sometimes it can mean near as in time. You know, like the new year is at hand. It's, it's closer now than it's been the rest of the year, right? It's at hand, and so it's, it's just right around the corner. And so it can sometimes mean that. But it can also mean just near as in like spatial location, at hand, okay? So for instance, a little, excuse me, young Owen Roberts were to come to me after service this morning and say, man, Mr. Edwin, I'm hungry. Man, can I eat some lunch? What do you guys think I would say? I, I would say, well, buddy, there's your dad, and there's your mom. Go ask them. What would I be saying? I'd be saying, look, look, your mom and dad are at hand. They are near. Go ask them. That's, that's what I would be saying. And really, that at hand is the idea of they're so close, we could almost reach out and put our hands on them. They're at hand. They're near. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is not saying the return of the Lord is about to take place, so instead of worrying about stuff, pray about it. What he's saying is, look, the Lord is near. He's right here. He's not way off in the distance. He has not abandoned us. He is with us. And so because he is with us, instead of chasing those needs and those desires and those wants, instead of worrying about them and being anxious about them, he says what you need to do is, you know, ask. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Look, the Lord is right here. He is at hand. I get it. You can't see him. You can't feel him. You can't hear him, literally. But he's near. So these things that you're worried about, these things that you're afraid, that if you don't fight and struggle and stand up for your rights, that you're not going to get. He says, here's how we deal with it. We go to the Lord. And the grammar here, which is not quite as apparent for us. This is one of those, I've mentioned it before, where in, in the language that Paul spoke, he used what's called a third-person imperative, and I don't want to get into a whole grammar lesson, but it's really fascinating because it's the idea, we don't have this in our language. What this is, it's like I'm talking to you, but I'm giving a command to the thing we're talking about. Okay? I'm, I'm talking to you, but the command is directed to the thing we're talking about. So he's talking to the Philippians, but the command is actually not directed at the Philippians. It's actually directed at the request. What is he saying the request must do? He said, your requests must be made known to God through prayer and supplication. Not that God doesn't know what we need. We know that he does. But he's saying, what are we supposed to do with them? Our requests aren't just supposed to sit silently in our minds, worried about and anxious over. Our, our requests are not supposed to sit there and we try to be manipulative and passive aggressive, which is what we do with one another. And that's our problem. We live in so much unhealthiness and dysfunction down in this world that we try to treat God the same way. You know, maybe if, I'm, maybe if I'm really worried, he'll notice. Maybe if, I, maybe if I look down and dejected, he'll notice and he'll ask me what I need. No, your requests must be made known to God through prayer and supplication. But notice this, with thanksgiving. And I think this is actually the heart of the command. The heart of the command is not that, in, that we attack worry with a prayer habit, we attack worry with a thanksgiving habit. I get it. What am I worried about? I'm worried about the things I want and don't have. But how about I start being thankful for the things I want and I do have? Because there's a lot of them. Anybody breathing today? I mean, are you thankful for that? Did anybody get to eat breakfast this morning? And if you didn't, was it because you purposely chose not to? Anybody got clothes on this morning? Thank you. <laughs> Anybody got brothers and sisters in Christ who love them and are surrounding them right now, wanting us to 
serve the Lord and be with him forever. Look, we got, there are plenty of things that we don't worry about because we've just got them. He says, let your request be made known to God with thanksgiving. Let's thank God for the things we do have. Thank God for the blessings we have, for the things we don't have to worry about. How about we thank God just for the fact that he said, you, are you worried about something? Look, you can come tell me about it. You can come talk to me about it. Parents, is there anything more heartbreaking than watching your kids go through something and you've tried to tell them, you know you can come talk to me, and they don't? Anything more heartbreaking than that? And yet that's where God is. He's, he says, look, come talk to me. Come bring it to me. Maybe we can thank God just for the fact that he lets us pray. How powerful is that? And God is a good father. Look, even evil, wicked fathers like us know how to give good gifts to our children. If they ask for a fish, we're not going to give them a snake. If they ask for bread, we're not going to give them a stone. How much more will our Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We can thank God knowing that however he responds to this prayer, he's going to do what's best. He's going to do the good thing. Because I do understand that sometimes I'm asking for the snake. And I don't realize it. And he gives me the fish. And it may take me a long time to realize that it's a fish. But I can give thanks to God that what God does is he gives good gifts. He always gives the best gifts. And so, what we learn from this, I forgot. He does go on and give us a consequence for this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you had the peace of God that surpassed all understanding, you think that'd be an easier place to, from which to rejoice? Even if you've got some sadness... Even if there's some other stuff going on in the world and in life that's kind of getting you down, if you had the peace of God in your heart, you think you'd be able to rejoice from that place a little bit more easily? I think so. And so he says, not only do we attack entitlement with reasonableness, he says, you know what? Overcome worry with thankful prayer. Overcome worry with thankful prayer. He moves on. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, think about these things. Why would Paul need to direct our thinking? Why would Paul need to direct our thinking to these things? Why would Paul need to tell Christians, look, here's where you need to spend your time and your mental energy. When you're just sitting there thinking, these are the kinds of things to think about. Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, what's just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think about that. Is it not because unless we purposefully direct our minds to these things, our tendency is to go the opposite direction? And if we have not trained our minds in this direction, what we naturally tend to do is go to the negative. Isn't that? Am I the only one? I mean, I get it. Some people are a little bit more optimistic, seemingly naturally, than I am. Some are not quite as cynical and jaded as I can be. But I think, naturally, don't we tend towards negative thinking? And so here is this weapon that Satan brings against us, negative thinking. Think about our two sisters. Okay, I don't know what their quarrel was. You don't know what their quarrel was. But again, I'm going to ask you, you ever been in a quarrel? What were you thinking about the person you were in a quarrel with? Were you thinking what a one, oh, this sister, this brother is just amazing. They're so awesome. They're good. They always do good things. Is that what you were thinking? Or were you thinking, what a rotten louse. I can't believe this joker. How does he think he can get away with that? He, she is arrogant, pompous, always stuck on themselves. All they ever want is what they want. They think they're better than me. They, they think they're better than me. How dare they? Which one of those do you naturally tend towards? I'm, I'm just asking. Anybody to the, the negative? Anybody? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. Why is it that these two sisters need to be told this? Because what they've got to do is they've got to direct their mind to the positive. I mean, look, here, here's, here's the reality. Please understand, whoever you're in a quarrel with, they're thinking all the negative things about you. And you're like, what? Why would they ever think those things about me? 
because we tend to judge ourselves based on our intentions and we judge others based on their actions and they're doing the same thing in reverse. And what Paul says is, look, in this situation, think about some positive things. Think about some positive things. And it's not just about about, about people. It's not just about the people that we're in these quarrels with. It's just about life in general. How often do we tend towards the negative instead of towards the positive? And so what Paul does is he says, look, think about these things. Now, I know that you will be thankful to know that uh, we are not going to walk through each one of these terms this morning. Maybe we will do that in a different lesson. In fact, Andrew did do that in a lesson a couple years ago. So this morning, I just want to focus on the first word, true. Whatever is true. Think about what is true. So the the word translated here can accurately be translated true. When we think about true, the opposite of that is false. Paul is telling us, think about things that are true, not things that are false. And listen, that is an accurate thing to do. That is a correct approach to this. I need to think about what's true. If If I'm caught up in what is false... Well, my thinking is going to go way off. But another equally valid translation of this word is real. What is true and what is real. Now, when I, when I recognize that this word means real, suddenly the opposite of this takes on a slightly different nuance. As opposed to false, I'm thinking about what is merely apparent. This is real. This is actual. This is apparent. It's just a story I'm telling myself. And so, for instance, all right, had a bad day at work. Anybody had a bad day at work? Very good. Well, no, it's not good you had a bad day at work, but I appreciate your honesty. We've all had bad days at work, right? We've had bad days at work. And by the end of the night, if you're like me, you know what? My boss hates me. My coworkers hate me. I don't know if I'm even going to be able to keep this job. I'm probably going to get fired. If I get fired, my wife will probably leave me. My kids will probably abandon me. I don't know if I can ever do anything else. I don't know if I could get another job. I'm probably going to end up living in a van down by the river. Some of that is real. Some of that is merely apparent. You know, the part of that that's real is, I had a bad day at work today, and that's the only part that's real. The rest of that is me getting involved in catastrophizing and terrible, spiraled out of control, negative thinking. Somebody pulls in front of me in the car, and of course, that joker thinks he owns the road. What an arrogant, pompous jerk I can't believe that. How dare he do that? He must think he's better than me. And of course, we're going to pass him and give him a piece of our mind. And we see it's one of our sisters from the congregation. (laughs) And all of a sudden we realize, you know, I bet she's just like me and got distracted because I pulled out in front of people like that before when I was distracted. (laughs) Or what about this? Somebody at school made fun of me. And they got some other people at school to make fun of me. And then they posted something nasty on social media about me. And by the end of the week, what I think is, you know, I, I must be a loser. I must be a loser. Nobody likes me. Everybody makes fun of me. You know, my parents are probably embarrassed. I can't talk to them about it. They wouldn't understand. This is so much pain. I'll probably feel this pain for the rest of my life. Nobody will ever, ever like me. I think I'm just a drag on everybody. The world would probably be better without me. Life is probably not worth living. Brothers and sisters, friends, neighbors, young people, please know that the only thing that's real in that whole list is someone made fun of you and got some other people to make fun of you. The rest of that is not real. You're not a loser. You're not worthless. Your parents aren't embarrassed by you. Life is worth living. You will not feel like that forever. But do you see what happens? We move to this negative thinking and it spirals out of control and and the joy is gone. And the ability to rejoice gets lost. 
And so Paul says, think about what is real. But I get it. Sometimes the real thing is a bad thing. Sometimes the diagnosis really is cancer. Sometimes what happened today at work is you really did get laid off and fired. Sometimes the real is negative and bad. I understand that. And so we can come at that in appropriate ways. And the scripture talks to us about how to approach the negative and bad things that happen in our life. But when we're talking about our kind of thinking, that's when we can jump to the rest of this. What is honorable? What is just? What is pure? What is lovely? What is commendable? What is excellent? What is praiseworthy? You know, sometimes the other person really is just being mean and they really are just sinning and they shouldn't be doing that. And so when the real really is bad, let's remember these other things. And I just, I just want to summarize these by taking a look at how Paul handled this in the beginning of Philippians in chapter 1. In verse 15, Paul came to a place where, look, there really was something bad going on. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. The real was bad. There were some people preaching the gospel not out of true motive of, of loving the Lord and really trying to save people because they were trying to be better than Paul and get people to like them more than they like Paul. And that's wrong. That's bad. The real really was bad. But listen to what Paul does next. What then? Verse 18. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I can rejoice. So I get it. Sometimes the real really is bad. So now let's look, and I hate to just use the, you know, the old positive thinking cliche, but let's look for the silver lining. Where is the thing I can be thankful for? Where is the part of this I can rejoice in? And I have to tell you, if, if you really get to the point, and sometimes we do, if you really get to the point that the only thing you can rejoice in is that, look, the world is falling apart, but at least I still have Jesus. That's something to rejoice in. And if that's the only thing you can have to rejoice in, that is the biggest thing to have to rejoice in. Because look, if you don't have Jesus, but you have the job, that's no reason to rejoice. If you don't have Jesus and your family loves you, look, that's no reason to rejoice. If you don't have Jesus, but you have perfect health, that's no reason to rejoice. But if you're Lazarus on the side of the road with sores that dogs are licking and a rich man who won't even give you crumbs to feed and you're begging and you die of starvation, but you're in Jesus, that's a reason to rejoice. And so even if that's the only thing you can think of, think about that one. Think about that one. Because it's big. And so, overcome negative thinking with realistic positivity. And one more. He continues on, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Why would the two sisters here need to hear this? He says, look, Yodia, Syntyche, you, you sisters need to remember what you heard from me. Y'all, he said they worked with him. They had heard him. They had listened to him. They knew what he said. They knew what he did. They had, they had worked with him. They had traveled with him some. They'd done something with him. He says, you know those things you heard from me, those things you received from me, those things you saw in me? He says, you need to do those things if you want the God of peace to be with you. Why would they need to hear that? Well, because clearly they're not doing those things, right? What things do you think they're doing? You know, it's possible that they've decided to follow some other teacher from some other religion. But I think if that was the case, we'd have a much different letter. I think they're doing what all of us do. Whatever they wanted. Does that make sense to you? Instead of doing what was right and what they had been taught, they were doing just what came naturally. Just what they wanted to do. I mean... You know what, maybe I have it wrong about them, but what about you? When you've been in your quarrels and your fights, what were you doing? Were you like me, just doing whatever it is you wanted to do? Because that's what I've done. And the problem is, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. 
I think I can direct my steps, but I can't. There's a way that seems right to me, but its way leads to death. And when I grasp that, I start to figure out what the enemy here is. And Satan's fourth enemy is self-deception. Because the reality is, it is hard to read the label when you're inside the bottle. It's hard to know what to do when you're smack in the middle of it. You know, I heard this from somebody one time, and at first I didn't like it, but I've actually come to accept it. The fact is, when I see what's going on in your life, I know exactly how to fix it. I know exactly what you need to do. But when I'm going through my own junk, I got no idea. I mean, I know, I think I know, but probably I would get better advice if I just went downtown and found the drunk sleeping on the bench and asked him, said, look, here's what I'm going through. What do you think I should do? I would probably get better advice from him than I give myself when I'm in the middle of my own stuff. Because I'm, I'm just like, I'm so blinded by all of my, well, sin, and arrogance, and pro all that. It's hard to read the label when you're inside the bottle. And so what do we do? We deceive ourselves. And so what does Paul tell these sisters? And what does he tell the Philippians? He says, you know what you need to do? You need to learn to submit. Instead of following yourself, you need to learn to Submit. Now, brothers and sisters, of course, what we all realize is I need to learn submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah, absolutely. I need to learn submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to do what he says and not what I want. The, the problem is that most of us walk through our lives assuming that what we want is what Jesus wants. And so I'm going to suggest to you that what we need to learn here is to submit to one another and to submit to the leaders that Jesus has placed in our lives. Because I'll tell you, most of us, when we say it's just me and Jesus, what it really is is just me. And if I can't listen to the other people that God has put in my life and take their advice and their counsel and their instruction and bring myself in submission to those people, I'm probably not bringing myself into submission to Jesus either. I think that's one of the reasons he puts us in churches. Yes, I understand not if they're telling us something that goes against what Jesus says. And so I understand there's a balance. Yeah, I've got I to be spending time in the Word. I've got to be figuring these things out. But I need to learn submission. Because when I can learn submission to others, then the God of peace will be with me. And also, by the way, I just want to point this out. If what you're doing is going around and asking people until you can finally find somebody who agrees with what you already think, you're still not submitting. I'm just going to point that out. I know this is odd for us because this is completely un-American. In fact, would it surprise you to know that the person who wrote these words was not an American. And what he tells us is if we want to be able to rejoice in the Lord when things are tough, when it's hard, when it's bad, and, and we want to have a bedrock, a foundation where we can still call up the joy that is in the Lord to rejoice in him, I need to overcome entitlement with reasonableness. I need to overcome worry with thankful praying. And wouldn't you know it, I just forgot what number three was. 
I'm getting old. Now I need to overcome negative thinking with realistic positivity. Thank you. See, by tonight, oh, I'm getting old. I probably have Alzheimer's and dementia. <laughs> They're going to have me fired by next Sunday. And I need to overcome self-deception with submission. When I do those things, I'll have a much better bedrock and foundation with which to rejoice. How are you doing at that? If you'd like to, you can put your Bibles away in your notes. We're going to sing another song. I do want to point out that Paul's statement is not simply rejoice. Paul's statement is rejoice where? In the Lord. I want, to, I want to point out to you, you know, you might learn how to rejoice all the time. You might learn how to rejoice in every situation. You might learn how to think about the positive. You might learn all those kinds of things. But if you're not in the Lord, none of this matters. And so if you want to be able to truly rejoice, you need to be in the Lord. Can we help you be in the Lord? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said, repent. And every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If we can help you enter the Lord this morning, won't you please come forward right now as we stand and sing.